Ladies and gentlemen, konnichiwa. I'm Joyce Ho, Principal Representative of the Hong Kong Economic Trade Office, Tokyo. On behalf of the ETO and Invest Hong Kong, I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar today on Hong Kong as a pro-business gateway to China. Today, we have more than 1,000 participants. This has shown the clean interests of Japanese friends to, uh, uh, offered, uh, to the opportunities offered by the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area development. Attaching great importance to the relationship between Hong Kong and Japan, the Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Mrs. Carrie Lam, will be sharing with us today the new opportunities arising from the Greater Bay Area development. Together with Mrs. Lam are the senior officials of the HKSAR government, including Mr. Edward Yao, Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, Mr. Alfred Sitt, Secretary for Innovation and Technology, Mr. Christopher Ho, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, and Mr. Tommy Yun, Commissioner for the Development of the Greater Bay Area. After Mrs. Lam's speech, we'll be having the sharing section with Kojima Sang, CEO of KDDI Hong Kong Limited, Yama Uchi Sang, Managing Director of Omron Hong Kong Limited, and Takashima Sang, Director General of Japan External Trade Organization Hong Kong. Then we'll be having a Q&A section at which you may pose your questions to our speakers. Mr. Stephen Phillips, the Director General of Investment Promotion of the HKSAR government will moderate the section. Last but not least, I'd like to thank our supporting organizations, including Jack Cho Hong Kong, K Dailan, K Zaido Yukai, the Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Hong Kong Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau Bay Area Entrepreneur Union, and the Hong Kong Trade and Development Council. Now, we'd like to first present to you a short video showcasing the strong ties between Japan and Hong Kong. I now invite the Chief Exec Executive, Mrs. Carrie Lam, to speak for us. Mrs. Lam, please. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joyce. Uh, good afternoon, uh, participants at this uh, webinar uh, with our Japanese uh, business community. First of all, uh, my deepest appreciation for the very enthusiastic response to this webinar. And secondly, is an apology because uh, this webinar was supposed to take place uh, last Thursday, uh, but I was out of Hong Kong. Uh, but the reason why I was out of Hong Kong uh, that afternoon is very, actually very relevant to what I'm going to share with you because uh, the, there was this meeting held in Guangzhou uh, under the leadership of Vice Premier Han Zheng uh, as the leader of the Greater Bay Area Leading Group at the uh, central level. And the Vice Premier Han Zheng came all the way from Beijing to Guangzhou to convene this special meeting. It's a special meeting to talk about the Greater Bay Area development. 
Uh, I'm afraid I could not disclose the details uh, at that meeting, which um, later on uh, you will know, <laughs> but I can uh, promise you that it's going to be very exciting and will create uh, far more opportunities for businesses based in Hong Kong that are interested in uh, gaining access into the Greater Bay Area. Now, coming back to Hong Kong, uh, for almost two years, uh, we have been facing unprecedented challenges. Uh, from the latter half of 2019, for almost one year, uh, Hong Kong was uh, affected by this uh, street violence, chaos, uh, riots that uh, got people very worried about law and order security in Hong Kong and hence uh, the broader business environment. And of course, like many places in the world, from January last year, uh, we were hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I am, I am quite confident to say that um, Hong Kong is now returning to normal on both fronts. On the law and order and security front, since the enactment of the national security law by the National People's Congress Standing Committee. We have seen the restoration of uh, stability and um, street violence has almost uh, totally disappeared from Hong Kong and things are going back to normal. Hong Kong people, including our business friends from overseas are now enjoying the rights and freedoms and, and, and peace of mind in Hong Kong. As far as COVID-19, um, we have been managing the situation actually pretty well by global standards. But of course, when people compare us to the mainland of China and to Macau, then perhaps uh, our cases are a little bit too many. But again, I would say that uh, through very stringent measures and our anti-epidemic strategy, we are now uh, keeping uh, any possible cases uh, under control. And that's why a couple of hours ago, uh, Edward Yao, the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, has announced the formal launching of a travel air bubble uh, between Hong Kong and Singapore. And my other colleague, the Secretary for Civil Service, has announced that we will expand a scheme called Return to Hong Kong for Hong Kong residents uh, living in mainland and Macau beyond the Guangdong province could also come back to Hong Kong without subject, being subject to the 14-day quarantine. In due course, say before the middle of May, we will expand this program uh, to other non-Hong Kong people residing in mainland and Macau. So likewise, they could also come to Hong Kong without being made subject to the 14-day quarantine arrangement. And I am pretty confident <laughs> that as the situation stabilizes on uh, different parts of the world, we will be suing, uh, seeing this uh, resumption of uh, travel and people-to-people -people, uh, flow because this is uh, so very important for a city uh, like Hong Kong, like Tokyo, which used to have uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, capital and uh, business uh, exchanges. I have asked my colleague to edit that two minute video. Uh, so it saves me a lot of uh, 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 figures and statistics to demonstrate to you that close relationship between Hong Kong and Japan. I would say, especially uh, in the last two years, or in the first two years since I took office on the 1st of July, 2017, uh, I've been to um, Japan three times uh, in that short period. Uh, I look forward to going for the <laughs> Tokyo Olympics, but uh, I'm not sure whether <laughs> a lot of outsiders will be welcome to the uh, Tokyo uh, Olympics. Uh, but the relationship uh, between Japan and Hong Kong is actually very, very close in all fronts, almost, uh, uh, ranging from uh, trade to investment, uh, to food, uh, import and uh, culture and student exchange, and of course, tourism. Uh, almost 2 million Hong Kong uh, visitors to Japan was recorded in 2019, and from Japan to Hong Kong, it's about 1 million. Uh, all this has been affected by COVID-19, but I'm sure given our strong ties and our very strong uh, fundamentals, uh, all these will come back pretty soon. Now, uh, this afternoon's webinar is, uh, is about Hong Kong as a pro-business gateway uh, to China. I would say that um, as a pro-business gateway to China, uh, we have all those strengths in place. And none of this, none of this have been affected by the national security law or what we are now talking about changes or improvements to the electoral system. 
if these two very important national initiatives have any impact on Hong Kong, uh, the impact is going to be positive for the business sector because they will create a much more stable uh, environment. They will make sure that Hong Kong as a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China is moving on the right track of one country, two systems. And I can assure you that uh, the central government is very committed to this important concept of one country, two systems. Reason, because it has, it has generally been working very well to resolve a historical problem since um, 1997. Secondly, is since 2019, the, um, the um, central authorities have already put this one country, two systems principle as one of the institutional strengths of the People's Republic of China under the Communist Party of China. So nobody would like, uh, nobody in the mainland or in a very senior echelon of government would like to see uh, the one country, two systems uh, not being successful. So that was a very fundamental strength of Hong Kong. And on top of that, uh, as an international city, we have all those important ingredients of the rule of law, the independence of a judiciary, uh, the use of English, the uh, protection of uh, intellectual property, um, the connection with the outside world, the high degree of autonomy to enter into bilateral and multilateral agreements. One of which we are very eager to join is RCEP, which is uh, 10 plus uh, five, uh, including Japan. Because over the years, despite our uh, enthusiasm, we have not been able to start an FTA <coughs> between Hong Kong and Japan. But now we have RCEP, and with the support of the central government and some of the ASEAN member uh, nations, uh, we would like to join the uh, RCEP uh, after ratification by the uh, uh, initial signatories. Now, uh, the opportunities are abundant, are abundant, uh, because under the 14 five-year plan uh, promulgated last month uh, by the central authorities, in the dedicated chapter for Hong Kong and Macau, uh, I will talk about the Hong Kong part. In addition to uh, recognizing and supporting Hong Kong's continued development in four pillar industries, that is International Financial Center, International Transport Center, uh, and uh, International Business and Trade Center and being the um, legal services hub in the Asia Pacific area, uh, we are given uh, additional support in four new sectors. Of course, much of it was because we, <laughs> we asked for it, we seek for it, and we demonstrate that we are ready for uh, doing well in these additional sectors. One is the International Innovation and Technology Hub. So Alfred is now our Secretary for Innovation and Technology. The second sector is um, the trading of intellectual property rights. The third is an international aviation hub because we are building our third runway, which should be ready next year. And the entire three runway system will be ready in 2024. And finally is in culture. Uh, we have invested very heavily in the West Kowloon Kowloon District and between now and maybe June next year, in a period of 10 months, Hong Kong will open two world-class museums. One is M Plus on contemporary art, and the other is uh, the Hong Kong Palace Museum, which is the, first, the only and the first museum that uh, could permanently display the treasures coming from the Palace Museum in Beijing. So with the, all these opportunities and this platform called the Greater Bay Area, which by itself is already a very huge market of 72 million population and 1.7 trillion US dollar in GDP and a growing and a rapidly growing sector, which will add at least five to 10% GDP every year to this sector. Uh, we have abundant opportunities, which we would like to share with our overseas business community. Because as you know, for over um, uh, 17 years now, we have the SIPA, the Closer Economic Partnership Arrangement, which is some sort of FTA between Hong Kong and the mainland of China, which gives uh, Hong Kong uh, goods, preferential access, tax-free entry, and also preferential access for the Hong Kong services. And the, uh, the beauty of SIPA is it is nationality neutral. 
So uh, Japanese uh, companies, uh, British companies that uh, set foot in Hong Kong will enjoy the same the same uh, preferential uh, treatment as uh, Hong Kong local companies into the Greater Bay Area or into the whole of uh, mainland under SIPA. Uh, GBA is, um, is very exciting because of the mission given to it by President Xi Jinping himself that he wants the GBA to be sort of um, facing the international world, that it should try to create innovation or breakthroughs in institutions and policies. In other words, uh, things or policies and practices that are not available in other parts of the mainland could be uh, devised for the Greater Bay Area. And Hong Kong and Macau being two special administrative regions are tasked to drive innovation in the Greater Bay Area. So uh, we, we do uh, uh, hope that we could have uh, even more Japanese companies uh, helping us and also partnering with us in seizing these opportunities. I'm sure you all know that uh, Japan is uh, ranked number one in terms of overseas companies with almost 1,400 Japanese companies in Hong Kong. Roughly 40 to 50% are using Hong Kong as the regional headquarters and regional offices. Yes, the last uh, 15 months or so because of COVID-19, uh, business has been affected. And yes, after the national security law, some confidence has been shaken. Uh, but I believe by now, and I hope to learn more later on from a general uh, survey that uh, anxiety about the national security law has subsided, but there are still worries about the business opportunity side and so on. And uh, uh, we can work together to identify more opportunities uh, for cooperation. But meanwhile, this afternoon, I, I love to answer whatever questions you have and uh, to receive uh, whatever views you will provide to me in taking forward the Hong Kong-Japan relationship. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, could I thank the Chief Executive for sharing the latest updates on the business environment in Hong Kong. Um, she shared with us some of the anticipated measures to relax um, the movement of people, obviously the very strong and close economic and business ties between Japan and Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong's continued important role as a business hub connecting China to the rest of the world, including to Japan. And of course, the strong central government support for Hong Kong and the one country, two systems in the 14th five-year plan and the very exciting Greater Bay Area development. And I think it was very important as well that the chief executive shared with us the aim to continue to have this favorable business environment in Hong Kong underpinned by the rule of law and independent judiciary. And we're shortly going to be hearing from three very knowledgeable members of the Japanese business community. And then after that, we'll be opening things up to a Q&A session. So if you have got any questions, please feel free to put them in the online chat function, either in Japanese or in English. And we'll take as many questions as we can, either addressed to Mrs. Lam and her team or to um, our three Japanese speakers. Let me very quickly introduce myself now. My name is Stephen Phillips and I lead a team um, at Invest Hong Kong, a department of the Hong Kong SAR government that helps international companies both set up and grow in and via Hong Kong. As you've heard from the chief executive, the Japanese business community and indeed Japanese entrepreneurs are a very, very important and valued segment of the international business community here in Hong Kong. Um, in Japan, we've got teams both in Tokyo and Osaka working hand in hand with our economic and trade office colleagues. And we also work very closely with our key partners at the Japanese consulate here in Hong Kong, Jetro, and the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And all of us would be delighted to help you after the session today. So let's now hear from each of our three um, preeminent leaders in the Japanese business community. 
Um, our first speaker is Kojima San, the CEO of KDDI Hong Kong Limited, who's going to share with us KDDI's experience of operating and using Hong Kong. Kojima San, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. I am uh, uh, Kojima of KDDI Hong Kong. Thank you very much uh, today for the opportunity to make a presentation at this webinar hosted by Invest Hong Kong. Today, I would like to explain how KDDI Hong Kong, which is engaged in the business of telecommunications, sees Hong Kong as a gateway to China, as, a, as well as the progress of digitalization, DX, that we often hear about these days, including examples of customers in the KDDI group. I would like to talk uh, to this point today. And before getting into the main content, let me briefly introduce myself. I was transferred to Hong Kong in April 2018, so about uh, three years ago. In 1991, I joined the former Kokusai Denshin Denwa Company Limited, KDDD, which is now KDDI. And uh, uh, when I was over 30 years old, I was transferred to Paris, France in March 2000. After returning to Japan in 2005, I worked on the planning of global network using international submarine cables uh, and uh, uh, planning and service planning, uh, global IT, ICT services for corporate clients. So I've been involved in KDDI's global business for more than 20 years. So uh, let me now introduce uh, the company to you. KDDI Hong Kong was established in 1988 by incorporating the former KDD Hong Kong office into a local subsidiary. We're now in our 33rd year of business. In addition to telecommunication services for corporate customers, we also provide a wide range of IT solutions for offices in order to become a company that responds to all the needs of customers, not just the IT environment. Our main customers are Japanese companies in Hong Kong. We provide a wide range of services called one-stop office service, such as office design, interior work, furniture, and moving arrangements, in addition to our IT solutions, which is our specialty. The selling point of one-stop office service is the detailed Japanese-style project management that has been well received by customers who have placed orders with us. If you are thinking of op opening an office in Hong Kong or relocating or renovating an existing office, please feel free to contact us. We also have KDDI Guangzhou and Shenzhen offices as bases around Hong Kong, and we are ready to take full care of our customers in the Greater Bay Area, which will become an integrated economic zone in the future. KDDI Guangzhou has a great deal of experience in handling factory projects. KDDI's offices in East Asia are uh, as shown in this figure, with Beijing as the East Asia headquarters. We also provide data center services in Hong Kong, Beijing, and Shanghai. Let's uh, take a look at the uh, ICT industry trend in Hong Kong. Currently, a number of global telecom carriers and IT operators are based and operating in Hong Kong. GAFA and other major cloud service providers also have data centers and business offices in Hong Kong. As many as 11 submarine cables have been landed in Hong Kong. The reasons for uh, the concentration of submarine cables in Hong Kong are as follows. Due to Hong Kong's positioning in the past, the traffic from China to overseas and from Southeast Asia to the US are concentrated in Hong Kong as a communications hub. In terms of Hong Kong being a hub, the same is true for the financial industry, the airline industry, and the shipping industry. On this page, you will find some interesting findings from the International Institute for Management Development, IMD. According to the IMD World Digital Competitiveness Ranking, Hong Kong is recognized for its knowledge, technology, and readiness for the future, making it the world's leading digital region among developed countries. Last year, Hong Kong was ranked fifth in the world, while Japan was as low as 27th. The gap between the two has widened since 2019. 
Well, East Asian countries are moving up in the rankings overall, only Japan is losing ground. In Hong Kong, the government is providing active support for digitalization, in addition to various support for promotion of digitalization of firms and support for the acquisition of land for data centers, which are the hubs of telecommunications, the government is actively promoting 5G mobile communications. This support is in line with the concept of the Greater Bay Area, that Hong Kong is responsible for the development of high-end services, innovation, science, and technology. So, uh, to sum up, Hong Kong continues to play a role as an ICT hub in GBA, as well as a gateway to China. Hong Kong is one of the leading cities among the advanced nations for communications infrastructure, including 5G. Hong Kong is and will continue to be a, a leading the world with the government smart city promotion and ongoing digitalization. The economy of Hong Kong has been slowing down and slow to recover due to various developments in Hong Kong for about two years and due to the spread of the uh, new coronavirus. However, the significance of locating a base in Hong Kong as a gateway to China is sufficient. In the second half of this presentation, I would like to explain the progress of digitalization during and after this pandemic, including some customer examples. This page is a document from a marketing and research company, IDC. The world is moving toward digital supremacy. By 2022, 65% of the world's GDP will be digital and $6.8 trillion will be invested directly in DX over the 2020-23 period. DX stands for digital transformation and is frequently used in conjunction with a remote work and BCP or business continuity plan. In short, uh, it uh, uh, means that the companies will use data and digital technologies to transform the organizations and business models to establish competitive advantage. Here are some customer examples in connection with the KDDI group's efforts to promote digitalization. Specific examples of digitalization are as follows. RPA, robotic process automation, IoT, Internet of Things, smart glasses, and chatbot. This page is a customer case study on smart glasses. In the past, skilled employees from Japanese factories used to travel to overseas factories on a regular basis to instruct local employees. But due to the pandemic, they can no longer make such trips. So they use uh, these smart glasses to instruct local employees on how to work by watching the images in Japan that the local employees are watching. As you can see on the right hand of the, the page, there are many other ways to use the system in addition to remote work and more and more customers are adopting it. The smart glasses are compatible with a variety of applications such as Zoom and Web Skype. So uh, it makes them a tool that can be easily integrated into various environments already in place. This page is a customer case study on RPA. Simply put, RPA is a tool for automating office tasks using software robots. In the case of this customer, they download data, uh, sales data from SAP and create weekly and monthly reports using Excel. The customer is able to streamline the office work by automating the routine and simple task and utilize the freed up human resources for other tasks. In fact, in the case of this customer, they were able to reduce their workload by 55 hours per month. Another benefit of introducing RPA is the elimination of errors. Since it is software, there's no mistakes, it doesn't complain. You have no need to negotiate salary. I have introduced two case studies, but the KDDI group is promoting digitalization and DX within the company and is actively making proposals to customers by utilizing the results of these efforts. So uh, we have increasing number of uh, cases that uh, show uh, deployment. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions about improvement of current business, please feel free to contact us. And that uh, concludes my present presentation. Thank you. Well, to take a
Thank you very much indeed for that sharing. Obviously, you shared with us the services of KDDI and your operations in Hong Kong, Shenzhen and Guangzhou, and actually in the context of the broader East Asia um, footprint, you've talked about the role of Hong Kong as a very important communications hub, and a hub for many other sectors as well. And also Hong Kong's leading position in 5G um, and also in smart cities. So thank you for that. Um, we're now going to turn to Yama Uchi-san um, from Omron, who I think will be sharing with us Omron's approach to the Greater Bay Area. Um, so perhaps over to you, Yama Uchi-san. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your introduction. I am Yamauchi of Omron Hong Kong. I'm happy to be given this precious opportunity from Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office to speak about our company. Today, I would like to share a company's challenge for GBA. I hope my presentation might be of your help to find out opportunities. I would like to explain about the businesses conducted by the Omron Group and Omron Hong Kong. Our company is famous for healthcare products widely among the general public, but our main business for more than half is factory automation. But compared to the skill of a sales and business operation, Omron is unique in developing a wide range of businesses from FA to social infrastructure and healthcare. We believe that Omron can contribute to the growth of Hong Kong and mainland China in such areas as FA and social infrastructure. Now, I'd like to talk about the Omron Hong Kong. Actually, we have been operating in uh, Hong Kong for more than 40 years in 1981. And of the global businesses, factory automation and component uh, businesses are what we do in Hong Kong. And next, the environment in Hong Kong and our operations. The environment surrounding Japanese companies in Hong Kong, including a company, has changed significantly, and the conventional business model as a gateway to southern China is no longer viable. As you can see from the survey conducted by Chamber of Commerce and Industry, many companies responded that it is necessary to downsize their operation or review their location and strategies in Hong Kong. So, under such circumstances, in 19, uh, 2019, we dissolved two out of five companies and integrated the rest into one. This integration mainly focused on the consolidation of back office functions for better efficiency. And Kojima-san just pointed out, but we also promoted digital transformation and also introduced a network flow, new workflow, including adoption of electronic signatures. So we can deal with it when we have to stay home. We will also introduce RPA for automation to achieve greater efficiency and successfully realize more streamlined and resilient operations. Not just uh, shrinking our resource, but we want we also shifted the resource at hand to growth sphere as much as possible. So the first thing we did was to solidify our defense. Now, next our move is uh, offense. In order to achieve a V-shaped recovery of business, we must explore new business opportunities. And in that respect, I think one of the big business, business opportunities is today's theme GBA. Omron Group has expanded business into South China, including Shenzhen, and has set up 14 sales spaces and one factory already. So it's not just about expanding a business. So what we thought was innovation. We found on innovation. We focused on innovation. We set up three new missions, namely treasury, logistics, and innovation. Let me explain how we address this innovation. 
Now, Home Run Hong Kong looked into a new mission that makes investment in startup companies in Shenzhen and creates new businesses by collaborating with them. As you know, Shenzhen is known as China Silicon Valley with about 12,000 high tech startups. The number of patent applications accounts for 52% of the total number of China. In collaboration with Jetro Guanzhou, as well as Japanese banks and consulting firms, we have exported many Shenzhen startup companies, especially in the area of AI enabled healthcare and robotics. We believe that being a company in Hong Kong would allow us to safely invest and recover investment in starting startup companies in Shenzhen, thanks to Hong Kong's taxation system and patent protection. In 2019, before the COVID-19 outbreak, we visited about 30 startup companies in Shenzhen. And in fiscal 2020, when we were just about to make investment, the COVID-19 outbreak occurred. So we faced with challenge of not being able to go to Shenzhen. We are currently conducting online interviews with startups. But when it comes to investment, it's, it, we have to be extremely cautious to proceed only by online interviews. Therefore, we resist our current strategy. And as you all know, Japanese companies are making a great success in food business in Hong Kong. And I thought, is success in Hong Kong only for food business? Are there any opportunities for electronic manufacturers like us? Then that is when I realized Hong Kong's smart city blueprint is indeed our new opportunity. We believe that Omron Group as a whole can contribute to the implementation of Hong Kong smart city, which be a solution to Hong Kong's social issues. Its concept also fits with Omron's corporate philosophy of solving social issues through our businesses. So, let me elaborate on Smart City Consortium, or SCC. SCC leverages IT to combat COVID-19 as well. It has also launched various efforts, including video consulting service and Leave Home Safe app, which you may be very familiar with. I've had the pleasure of joining SCC as a committee member with the help of my various connections. I think we are the only Japanese company sitting on the committee. With SCC and Hong Kong Science Parks Corporation, I wish to contribute to the development of Hong Kong through the implementation of Smart City. Now, specifically, what are we doing? Of the three areas, we thought that smart living, smart building, smart warehouse, and smart mobility and energy are the areas which our technology may contribute. For example, in healthcare, we have this device to measure the blood pressure. So maybe we can make contribution or probably we can uh, collaborate with the chemical companies to create something that combat the COVID-19 and for mobility and energy, we would like to offer our products and services that are only available in Japan so far, or probably we can provide a factory automation technology capabilities to various important fields in Hong Kong. So these are things that we are striving for. And once the COVID-19 is, is over, and as soon as this travel restriction is lifted, we want to um, translate uh, this, these examples into GBA. Now, I believe that uh, government's GBA-related measures will be explained by Mr. Takashima after me, but I look forward to GBA measures that are more focused on Hong Kong. Now, 
to realize the uh, Hong Kong Smart City Blue uh, Print cooperation from all the companies and participants here today will be greatly appreciated. It is difficult for Omron alone to realize it. We hope that we can make a contribution to realizing the Hong Kong Smart City as an all Japan effort. We look forward to your cooperation. That is all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, Yamabuchi-san, thank you very much indeed for sharing with us Omron's approach to GBA, um, your plans to leverage the innovation um, taking place particularly in startups within the region, but also recognizing the particular strengths of Hong Kong as you contemplate making such investments. And also very interesting how you're working with the Smart City Consortium, but in the longer term, once COVID allows, um, rolling that out to the wider GBA uh, and encouragingly working in a collaborative way with other Japanese companies. And it's now really um, over to our third speaker, a um, good friend of mine, Takashima San from Jetro, who I think will be sharing with us his perspectives on Hong Kong's value and future prospects as a business hub, of course, in particular for Japanese companies. So, Takashima San, over to you. Hi, and Jetro uh, Hong Kong, Takashima. My name is Takashima uh, with Jetro Hong Kong, thank you. And the, uh, Chief Executive Carrie Lam and uh, people with the Hong Kong government uh, and my friend, uh, Director General Stephen Phillips, uh, ladies and gentlemen in, uh, in Japan. First, uh, I would like to thank the uh, Hong Kong government for this opportunity uh, to have the Japanese people uh, understand the real situation in Hong Kong. And because uh, to the extent I know, uh, with the participation of uh, Chief Executive holding such a big uh, web seminar is the first of, well, the, this is the first instance and thank you for choosing Japan for this. Now I say this because uh, between Japan and Hong Kong, uh, there's a widening gap uh, of understanding about uh, Hong Kong and uh, this might uh, impact the business. So I have a great uh, concern about this issue. Uh, since the uh, demonstrations in 2019, over well, every uh, uh, quarter, uh, we have been conducting a qu questionnaire survey about the uh, business sentiment and uh, uh, managerial issues of Japanese companies uh, with uh, the uh, Japan consulate, uh, the JCCI in Hong Kong, and JETRO. And uh, you know, uh, sitting next to uh, the chief executive is uh, Edouard Diao, and uh, the three organizations make a report to uh, uh, him. Now, uh, well, about 30% uh, of the uh, uh, Japanese companies' respondents uh, in April said that the headquarters are looking at uh, the uh, well, uh, situation in Hong Kong uh, rather pessimistically. If you just look at the Japanese press, uh, you may have a suspicion that uh, no longer uh, foreign companies are not able to operate, but uh, the business environment that is friendly to foreign companies and the residential environment uh, conducive to foreigners uh, remain unchanged. That is something I would like to say unequivocally here. What you see is the overview of the budget of Hong Kong government. I see no other example uh, from overseas where the draft budget is uh, uh, announced uh, in Japanese. And you see the uh, booking site of uh, coronavirus uh, inoculation uh, opened by the government in addition to three official languages in nine languages, detailed explanation is given. So they treat uh, uh, the a variety of foreigners as Hong Kong citizens. Now today, I would like to speak to these uh, uh, three e e themes briefly. First, about the uh, spread of the e coronavirus. From November, uh, the end, uh, the e fourth wave has been stagnating. Um, well, so the, with the tests and the uh, quarantine, it has been managed. And the Hong Kong government uh, well codified the regulations uh, and uh, uh, they e well enforce the law uh, based on the rules, clearly. And uh, they had the fiscal rig room for uh, economic uh, measures. And so uh, the centering about around uh, employment, uh, major uh, measures 
were uh, taken, benefiting a lot of Japanese. But uh, the uh, continuation of entry restrictions with Japan and China are still representing bottlenecks for the Hong Kong economy and Japanese companies. Next, I would like to talk about the economic impact of the pandemic. In a nutshell, the uh, Hong Kong population is 7.5 million, uh, very uh, limited. No matter how well the uh, export and the domestic uh, demand recovers, the economy will not com come back to normal easily. Now, let's uh, take a look at uh, the uh, retailers among various economic indicators. With the uh, pandemic, the uh, consumption structure has changed dramatically. People eat at home and are not uh, eating outside. Because of this, they uh, tend to buy more at the supermarkets and the econo uh, econo uh, electronic commerce. And uh, the cosmetics and the high-end uh, products are depend dependent on the foreign customers are uh, decreasing. Against this backdrop, the uh, agricultural products and food from Japan in 2020 uh, increased uh, for 16 years in a row. The uh, number one uh, well, export uh, destination is Hong Kong. And uh, the uh, Japanese meat, vegetables, eggs, and seasonings, and also Japanese sake and plum wine have been supported by Hong Kong consumers. Next, let's take a look at the situation of Japanese companies. Japanese uh, uh, customers, uh, well, uh, you're familiar with uh, DI, which you're familiar with in connection with the uh, Bank of Japan's Tankan survey. This uh, is uh, actually um, the uh, uh, diffusion index up until the uh, uh, third quarter last year, uh, the uh, manufacturing in Guangdong province and uh, uh, also led by the recovery of sales toward uh, China, uh, the uh, uh, Hong Kong domestic demand is also growing in the fourth quarter. And Japanese companies, there are 1,400 Japanese companies in Hong Kong. A little less than uh, half of them uh, have uh, uh, the original headquarters in, in Hong Kong, or including manufacturing uh, headquarters. And uh, uh, a little more than half of them, the remainder, are doing business for the domestic demand for Hong Kong. And uh, so uh, a lot of uh, companies are affected by the economic situation in China and the conflict between uh, US and China. In other words, uh, so many uh, Japanese companies are doing uh, business toward China from Hong Kong. So. Uh, this is the evaluation of Japanese companies about the national security law. Immediately after the introduction of the law, uh, it was uh, uh, July last year, but compared with that in April uh, this year, the uh, concerned people uh, were concerned, uh, dropped by 30%, but half of the companies are still concerned, worried, and in order for this concern to be dispelled, uh, we have to have a track record uh, of uh, uh, the law not affecting business activities and uh, people's lives. And uh, with respect to the impact of the establishment of the law, uh, we see an increasing number of respondents who say there's no impact. But as of uh, April, 15 companies say there has been a negative impact, including the relocation of uh, uh, employees and uh, the investment freeze. And Hong Kong has been uh, witnessing a major change over the last several years, but uh, the international financial function, international logistic function, and simple and low rate tax, uh, there is no uh, change in the evaluation of these uh, business advantages. So this is uh, a questionnaire survey result conducted uh, East Asia wide. And uh, the four items from the right, the quality of employees, the trade, uh, procedures, tax, and the stability of the currency. Uh, the evaluation has been quite high because there are not many issues. On the other hand, if you look at the extreme left item, the uh, uh, de development of uh, new customers is hindered. Uh, the evaluation is quite low because of the continuation of entry restriction with China, which is uh, the uh, sales and marketing zone for uh, Hong Kong. With respect to the direction of Japanese companies, in April, uh, about 60% of the companies say it's remaining unchanged. And uh, this is not mentioned there, but uh, 
38 companies said they are reducing the scale or they are reviewing the headquarters function. Well, uh, people used to uh, go from Hong Kong to Guangdong uh, for management of a factory, say, but uh, they cannot do it for more than one year. So there are more, uh, some companies that are uh, shifting some uh, employees from Hong Kong to China. I'm sure that uh, the Hong Kong government is making enormous efforts to address this issue. But uh, one of the reasons why Japanese companies have uh, office in Hong Kong is a good access to uh, China. So we'd like to ask the Hong Kong government to work on the issue of uh, entry between Hong Kong and China. And in terms of financial services, the uh, uh, funds are flying away from Hong Kong, but uh, there's no such data that uh, corroborate that. The, uh, between the US and China uh, conflict is uh, intensifying. And so because of that, uh, funds are coming to Hong Kong. The uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange says connecting China, connecting the world. So uh, by connecting with China and the world, the Hong Kong uh, financial uh, function is growing. Let me talk about uh, GBA lastly. One characteristic of GBA is with the growth of uh, uh, Hong Kong, the innovation is uh, now becoming a characteristic of Hong Kong. So right now, uh, the uh, Hong Kong is uh, uh, well make, giving advantage to Japanese companies who are trying to do innovation in Hong Kong. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Kogsmart, which is a startup from Tohoku University. Kogsmart, uh, immediately after its inception, uh, have opted for entry into the Hong Kong market, looking at the Chinese market. If you just look at Hong Kong, there's a limit to the market and the function. But if you look at the GBA uh, wide, then uh, you can uh, see there are financial services uh, function and also research and development activities in Shenzhen. And so, Please look at uh, uh, GBA wide uh, when you look at Hong Kong. I would, let, I would like to conclude my remarks. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much for sharing that information. Um, I know that my colleagues across government and, and the team at Invest Hong Kong find the survey, um, the survey very useful. Um, the deep and considered insights are of value to us, but of course of value um, to Japanese businesses. And getting down to that granular level, I think, is very important indeed. Um, it's very positive that the survey still shows Hong Kong plays such an important role for Japanese companies in the context of the country as a whole. But also we note um, the slightly concerning trend of some staff being re relocated from Hong Kong to the mainland. But I think some of the factual analysis in your survey is also really useful for companies because they need to make decisions based upon facts and not upon some of the rumors that we see in the media. So thank you very much for sharing that. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now heard from all of our speakers and we're now going to move into the question and answer session. We've got roughly 30 minutes or so. Um, so there's still plenty of time for you to submit any questions that you've got through the online chat function, um, again, in Japanese or English. Um, we've already see, received quite a number of questions online, um, but also a number of questions in advance from the Japanese Chamber um, and JETRO um, members. And perhaps I can kick off um, by addressing a few of those questions, both to the Chief Executive and her team, and then to each of our speakers from the Japanese business community. We're going to try to tackle as many questions as we can, um, but if we don't, um, we will get back to people after the event today. So perhaps I could turn to the Chief Executive. Um, quite a lot of questions relating to um, the travel measures, the travel restrictions due to COVID. Um, so perhaps if you could share a little bit more information on when you think restrictions will be lifted, particularly between Hong Kong and Guangdong and Shenzhen to allow international business travelers to move back and forth. Um, is Hong Kong considering further travel bubbles, um, particularly obviously relevant to this audience with Japan and what might the timing for that be? 
And also, are there any plans to reduce the 21 days hotel quarantine um, for Hong Kong residents returning, let's say, from Japan to Hong Kong? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, let me uh, express my personal appreciation to the three guest speakers for their very informative um, uh, uh, sharing, especially for Jack Troll's survey. Uh, actually, I've been following uh, Jack Troll's regular surveys uh, passed to me by Edward. Uh, I think the survey reflects a very candid and true situation of a Japanese uh, companies in Hong Kong. Uh, initial period, concern, legitimate. Uh, but over a period of time, uh, that concern about national security subsides. But now the major concern is about the business environment, especially the travel uh, of people and goods and so on. Now, I put the, the answers to your question, Stephen, in a very broad context. Uh, two weeks ago, I announced a new direction in Hong Kong's anti-epidemic um, effort. After 15 months, we have accumulated enough experience and we have enhanced our capability on various fronts, whether it is in COVID-19 testing, uh, in contact tracing of the close contacts, in um, building up more quarantine facilities, as well as isolation beds in hospital authority. So I have announced that in this new direction, that is from now onwards, we would refrain from that uh, stop and go. As you are seeing, some European uh, countries are still stop and go. Suddenly, they allow everything to happen. Suddenly, they lock down the city and so on. So Hong Kong wants to go back to normality in a gradual, orderly manner and try not to push things back. So we will uh, refrain from a stop and go. We will refrain from a one-size-fits-all approach. So whether in terms of uh, the period of quarantine, 21 days, 14 days, seven days, we will not one size fits all. We will adjust it in accordance with the um, situation where the passengers are coming. So for low risk countries like Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand, it's no longer 21 days, it's 14 days. And I see uh, good prospects for reducing it further, especially with vaccination. But for the very high risk like India, then we have to go for the most stringent measure banning uh, any flights from India. So with that overall direction and contest in place, uh, one would imagine that um, uh, as long as uh, the place where the, uh, uh, the business people is coming from is generally stable, then that gives us a very good basis to um, relax the arrangements. Now, mainland is exactly in that situation. Uh, after um, uh, the first three months, actually, the mainland of China has been controlling uh, the epidemic very, very well. Okay. Uh, but sometimes life is true of paradox because they are doing so well. <laughs> That's why they are very stringent in uh, relaxing the uh, uh, people flow with Hong Kong. But as I have said at the beginning of my remarks, we are already moving in that gradual direction. So now Hong Kong people could come back, whether it's from Guangdong or outside of Guangdong without 14 days, as long as they could produce a COVID-19 negative test. And when they come back, they stay at home, they can go out. But on the day 12, they do another COVID-19 test. Now this scheme will then be expanded to other people in the mainland. So a Japanese uh, businessman who had been in Beijing for the last month or so could also get a quota to come to Hong Kong without the 14 day. So the then remaining question is the return trip. So for Hong Kong people or uh, Japanese business people coming from mainland, if they want to go back or for Hong Kong people, including Japanese business people who want to go in for the GBA is that 14 day quarantine imposed uh, by the central authorities. Um, I cannot commit to a uh, specific timetable, but I would uh, say that uh, it will happen gradually because <coughs> Guangdong is equally keen like us. Shenzhen is equally keen like us, but we all look to the central authorities uh, because of this overall uh, policy of China that uh, having paid such a huge price, they are not uh, readily uh, relax or give in uh, with all this risk. But uh, I'm sure that um, uh, with our situation further stabilized and better controlled, um, the, the opportunity will come for us to uh, relax. I will invite Edward to say a few things about Hong Kong and 
overseas. Okay, yeah. Well, if you do a, a, a poll in Hong Kong, asking Hong Kong people where they want to uh, start traveling, I think it will be overwhelmingly <laughs> Japan, no <laughs> doubt about it, and you will lead the, the second place by a very wide margin. So in fact, um, um, the C has mentioned that we are in fact working very hard to arrange a kind of air travel bubble uh, with partners, which we both feel comfortable. Now the concept of air travel bubble is these two places, be they country or cities, like between Hong Kong and Singapore, must be uh, on a relatively uh, sort of safe and stable uh, environment. So that, well, both sides will be comfortable in allowing uh, our people to travel to and fro within a so-called bubble arrangement. That means everything being protected. Well, uh, uh, protected. Now, the, the bubble arrangement is one that uh, we are counting on double PCR tests. That means people, uh, before they board on the plane, they must demonstrate that they have a negative result for the PCR test. So they are clean. And upon arrival at the airport, uh, at our respective airport, will be a test and hold arrangement where people will be tested again and therefore proven sort of a uh, no case, then they will be allowed to go into the city uh, without any quarantine of arrangement. Now for this type of arrangement, the beauty of it is we don't, we don't sort of uh, specify what's the purpose of visit because well, that is to give the maximum freedom and flexibility, including business, including family reunions, study, whatever, or of course, traveling. Now, um, it must be built on a mutual sort of a, a, a sense of comfort that the two places are, are safe. Now, uh, I, I think Hong Kong is also waiting anxiously uh, if Japan could join places like Singapore or uh, in the days to come, perhaps in New Zealand, Australia, where Hong Kong people can travel between two places. Now, um, we, we have been keeping very close in touch uh, through uh, the uh, Consulate General. I've, I've been talking this uh, with Ambassador Wader just uh, more than a week ago, uh, and we'll be updating uh, the Japanese community uh, about our arrangement, because, well, the, the bubble arrangement does not confine to Hong Kong and Singapore. It should be an arrangement where we can apply uh, so, uh, to any other partners wherever we feel comfortable. So I think that's arrangement. But of course, I think we do, we do understand that different places might have different situations. So uh, for the time being, as the CE mentioned, there are sort of a different quarantine requirements taking into account of the different risk factors. So for the time being, before the bubble is kicked in, uh, I think we have to live with the situation. Uh, but I believe well, uh, the constant dialogue is going on and well, we very much hope that well, this will uh, be extended to uh, between Hong Kong and Japan uh, in the soonest pos possible time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, CE, perhaps we could go on to a different subject. And um, if you could share your thoughts on Hong Kong's future role as an international financial centre, um, and also touch upon the importance of the Wealth Management Connect in, in the context of the Greater Bay Area, please. I'll say a few words about the subject, and I will invite the Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury, uh, Chris Hui, to uh, elaborate. Now, one is I said at the beginning that um, Hong Kong's international financial center is still very important and is highly valued by the central people's government. Uh, I have been told uh, many times in my meeting with senior officials that uh, Hong Kong's position as an international financial center is irreplaceable, so to speak, because people are worrying about Singapore and Shanghai and, and so on, but um, it is irreplaceable because it needs a long time to build up an international financial center. And this uh, sector is now becoming so very important, not only for Hong Kong, but also uh, for the mainland because uh, President Xi has committed to a continuous and deepening reform and opening up of uh, the capital markets in the mainland of China. So, uh, and the second point is Hong Kong's financial center is highly resilient, as one could see in, and reproduce in graphical presentations by Jetro that the, the capital inflow, the bank deposits, and the listing in the stock market, the daily transactions, all these figures were still going up 
uh, despite the um, sort of uh, traumatic situation in the last two years. Uh, listing in Hong Kong through IPO was the world's number two uh, last year. And uh, in recent years, we have also become the world's number two in the biotechnology uh, companies listing. Uh, and I, I can tell you, I still have a, 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 a few goodies in my pocket <laughs> that have yet to be announced. Uh, again, once travel could resume, that is a GBA uh, Wealth Connect scheme and uh, the ETF Connect scheme, the Asia's uh, Futures Trading in Hong Kong, the Bond Connect uh, South Bank, all these goodies are ready in one way or another because um, it's not just a question of uh, the central authorities are favoring Hong Kong, giving us good things. It also, they are producing the, the very good um, experimental ground for the opening up of the mainland capital markets in a very controlled manner. So the same for the Private Wealth Management Connect, Chris. Mm. Uh, thanks, CE, and thanks, Stephen, for the question. Um, before I answer the question, maybe I can share with this uh, audience some basic facts. Uh, first of all, in terms of the um, market cap of our stock market, basically right now it's around like 14 times of GDP. And among them, of course, the Japanese companies have a role to play because right now there are around like 10 companies from Japan that are listed in our market, just number one in terms of the stock market. And number two, if we talk about the, uh, in a broader context of the asset under management out of Hong Kong, right now the AUM, to speak, managed out of Hong Kong is around 10 times of the GDP and of which basically more than 60%, 60% is from origin other than Hong Kong. So I think all these figures illustrate one point, that is Hong Kong is used to be a place, and it now is the place, where we provide our financial services and pro professional services to economies globally, which is far exceeding the size of ours. And that's very natural because we are city economy, and also in terms of financial services, you see no borders, and that's why this is something that we continue to cherish and continue to be the pace uh, in so far as Hong Kong is concerned. And going forward, as highlighted by the chief executive just now, there are a number of initiatives that are in flight in terms of what are going to further enhance Hong Kong's role in the National Financial Center. And he, she highlighted a Wealth Management Connect, Bond Connect, so on and so forth. And before I look into more deeply the Wealth Management Connect, uh, there's also some figures I want to highlight. First of all, in terms of the um, proportion of high net worth families now that you can see in the GBA area is around one fifth of the overall China. And by high net worth families, we are talking about uh, families with uh, disposable assets of uh, six to seven million RMB, which roughly the size of one million US dollars. And this is a definition that we use in Hong Kong to classify a family as a high net worth family. So you can see that there's a high concentration of wealth here in this part of the world. That's number one. And number two, in terms of the connectivity that we already have with the mainland, uh, as highlighted by Chief, Chief Executive just now regarding the Stock Connect and Bond Connect, basically we see a tremendous growth over the past few years. Like, for example, in terms of the uh, Stock Connect over the past two years, we see almost doubling of the turnover uh, utilizing Stock Connect. And in terms of the Bond Connect right now, we only have the northbound Bond Connect, i.e. utilizing international capital to invest in the interbank bond market in China. We also see like almost 50% growth in turnover. And also at the same time right now, around 40% of the trade, of the, of the bond are being traded by international investors in the Chinese interbank bond market is being transacted through Bond Connect. And you may ask why people or international investors are so comfortable using Hong Kong as the gateway to enter into China to trade stock and bonds. The answer is simple, because Hong Kong offers an internationally competitive and also environment which the international investors find comfortable. And it's underpinned by the rule of law, the way we do business, and our international standards. And of course, at the same time, our quality financial regulation. And all these are continuing to stay going forward and also provide a perfect platform for us to launch our Wealth Management Connect as highlighted by Chief Executive just now. Because right now, if you talk about the already established connectivity programs that we have with the mainland, Stock Connect is for the stock market and the uh, Bond Connect is for the bond market. And so far as the Wealth Management Connect is concerned, we are talking about the bank sector, i.e. we have investors on both sides of the boundary, be they in the GBA area, through the mainland banks in China, they can buy the products being offered uh, by our banks here in Hong Kong. 
and reciprocally for the northbound Richmond Connect, i.e. for international money in Hong Kong, they can through the banks in Hong Kong buy the products offered by the Chinese banks. And to start, uh, we will start with some more uh, relatively low risk products, more bond related products, which will offer in line with the risk appetite of the investors on both sides of the boundary. And also similar to the success of the Bond Connect and Stock Connect, we'll have quota both at the market level and also at the individual investor level to enable an orderly flow of capital cross boundary. And all these successes, I think very much hinge on the fact that we know China well, we know the regulatory environment on both sides of the boundary, of the bond boundary well, and also we know how we can foster closer connectivity between China and Hong Kong in a way which is in line with the national policy and also in line with what Hong Kong can offer. So going forward, in terms of asset management, uh, in terms of um, Ruminbi business, in terms of our role as an overall offshore Ruminbi center, I think these business are going to be strengthened going forward. And in particular for Japan, I would say that there are a few things that you may also like to take note, is that we are now um, having a multiple strategy to develop our PE VC industry. And in fact, we have been spoken to many PE and VC funds in Hong Kong, and they, many of them are interested in the technologies being offered in Japan in terms of the uh, general tech and also services catering for the aging population there. Because there are many cultural and also socioeconomic similarities between Hong Kong and Japan in terms of our social demographics. And many of these technologies being developed in Japan are very interested by our investors here. So as we grow our asset management business here in Hong Kong, I'm sure that there will be many synergies between Hong Kong and Japan where we can grow deeper and also grow further. Thank you. I just add that uh, there is another uh, sector in the financial industry, and that is insurance, uh, which, of course, uh, many Japanese uh, companies are very strong. In insurance, uh, we are not sort of talking about insurance connectivity because uh, main lenders are already able to buy insurance products in Hong Kong. So we now have a measure endorsed by the GBA leading group that will allow Hong Kong insurance companies, of course, including um, Japanese insurance companies, to set up after-sales offices uh, in the GBA mainland cities, for example, in uh, Guangzhou, Nansa, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and, and so on. So there is already this promulgated measure. We just need to put it in place after discussions with the relevant authorities. So in each and every aspect of the financial industry, a lot of work is uh, going on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure everybody um, appreciates how many different strands of financial services are going on. Perhaps now we could move back to the tech sector and a question for Kojima-san, actually. Um, could you just share with everybody the advantages of Hong Kong for Japanese companies in ICT and technology? And the second part of the question really is, what are the differences between the environment in Hong Kong and on the mainland of China, which you think Japanese companies can leverage? Uh, I'll say something and then I'll invite the Secretary for Innovation and Technology to elaborate. I think one of the speakers just now described that uh, within the GBA, uh, there is a place for the China Silicon Valley, that is Shenzhen, because of the uh, many tech advanced uh, companies uh, there. But if you look at GBA, particularly with Hong Kong, I would describe that the GBA has a whole ecosystem for technological development. So it is Silicon plus Wall Street. <laughs> so uh, the strength of Hong Kong, which complements this, um, uh, this Shenzhen Silicon Valley, is our R&D, particularly in basic research. Um, not being complacent, but in this part of the world, that is the GBA, the best universities are in Hong Kong. Five of our universities are amongst the top 100, and they've been producing a lot of wonderful uh, basic research. But hitherto, uh, we have not been able to help them to uh, translate and commercialize their research. And because we don't have a lot of manufacturing and prototyping facilities in Hong Kong, that is a uh, handicap. But now if Hong Kong and Shenzhen or Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Dongguan join hands, then we have the whole chain to uh, translate our good basic research in collaboration with Shenzhen uh, through prototyping and then into advanced manufacturing and mass production and then startups and then equity raising IPO, come back to Hong Kong with a biotech listing and so on. 
So this is really unique. Um, the Silicon Valley in San Francisco Bay Area doesn't have this uh, full spectrum. Uh, I think Japan is, is quite like us. Japan also has a Tokyo um, Stock Exchange and, and all these uh, uh, other ingredients. So that means the GBA and Japan could actually consider at the more global level and macro level how we complement each other. And uh, that's why during my uh, last two visits to uh, Tokyo, I also spent time with the Japanese technology uh, sector and I invited a group of uh, technology professors to come to Hong Kong thereafter to um, identify opportunities for collaboration. Uh, the COVID-19 and the social unrest has sort of upset a bit what I have wanted to do, but I'm sure we could pick up. I'll invite Alfred to say a few things more. Thank you, CJ. Some people told us that Hong Kong had entered into a golden era for internet, well, innovation and technological development. So the reason behind this statement is that I think there are two main reasons. One is the support and commitment of the Hong Kong SL government. In this term of office, we have already committed 15 billion US dollars in development of our INT. And the second is to support our central government. In the 14 five plan, 14 year five plan, it stated clearly that the central government is going to support Hong Kong to develop as the international INT hope in the GBA. So we have very strong support from the central government for to make this uh, development of INT in Hong Kong successful. So I give one example about the recent development to build Hong Kong as an INT hub. That is the Hong Kong Sumjan Innovation and Technology uh, Park in uh, the Loop area. That is an area near the Sumjan. So as what CE has just mentioned, we can have a very good strategic advantage to combine and integrate the two areas together. Hong Kong is really good in the uh, basic research. We are strong and have five university ranked as the top 100 university in the world. We are really good in basic research. And also we are a good and international financial center. But for some gen, well, it is good in advanced manufacturing. So that is really good uh, opportunity for us to work closely with some gen so that we can make uh, the supply chain and the home uh, system uh, as the good integration for basic research uh, applied research as well as uh, prototyping and uh, certification and testing as well as advanced manufacturing. So the whole complete process for innovation and technology and make it possible. As what Chief Secretary, Chief Secretary just mentioned, we are really good in basic research, but that is problem that we are going to apply the, uh, the research result into commercialization. That's the area that we can look at the uh, some general others city in the GBA to make it possible for us to make the innovation and technology result through the commercialization process and improve our economy and support uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the improvement in, in the whole uh, uh, situation of Hong Kong. Yeah, that's why I would like to... Yeah. But if, if you ask me to identify particular areas uh, for working with Japan, I would say is AI and robotics, as well as health technology. And uh, these are exactly the two areas which we have invested heavily to build up what we call the Inno Hong Kong clusters at the Hong Kong Science Park. And uh, likewise, uh, Shenzhen is also very keen uh, to work with us in, the, in these uh, few areas. Uh, when I was in um, uh, Tokyo, I did visit um, some of the hospitals and the uh, medical research. Uh, what they are doing actually is very similar to what we are starting to do, but uh, Japan clearly has uh, many years ahead of us. For example, in genome medicine, uh, which we are just uh, embarking on, uh, but um, uh, this is an area which will move very fast and will be very uh, beneficial to mankind, because um, as Chris has said, Japan and Hong Kong and in fact Japan and China are facing similar demographic uh, challenges. So if we could apply technology to a better humankind, I think we are doing uh, good things for, for the people. Thank you very much. And CE, can I ask a question? Would you be able to spend another 10 minutes or so with us? Yes. We've got so many questions. Yes. Thank you very much. And um, perhaps I could then just um, do a follow on question really relating to the tech sector. Talent is a big issue all around the world. Um, but one of the questions we've had 
Is Hong Kong facing any pressures on losing young talent? And are there any schemes to bring in high quality talent to Hong Kong um, in those tech related industries? Well, there have been some uh, talk about uh, immigration, people leaving Hong Kong because <laughs> of national security law. I take the view that uh, talents by definition are very mobile. So uh, if people want to uh, find greener pastures, that's fine. But at the same time, uh, we will attract people to Hong Kong. Um, one thing that uh, I touched upon during my meeting on the GBA uh, last Thursday is uh, one of the top, top priorities of the entire GBA is to attract and recruit talents. And these are talents from all over the world. And um, it was agreed by the uh, senior officials in, um, in uh, the mainland is, yes, you need more, far more talents for the entire Greater Bay Area. So uh, what we are doing uh, for talents, of course, we have all sorts of schemes to bring in uh, skills that we do not have in Hong Kong. Um, pretty soon, I think next month, we will launch what we call a global STEM professorship scheme. Uh, that's a pretty generous scheme uh, that will cost us 2 billion Hong Kong dollars to bring in um, uh, research talents uh, in the STEM discipline from all over the world to come to work in Hong Kong. They will be given a chair professor position in uh, one of the universities. They will be given startup funds to set up their laboratories. They will be uh, welcome to bring along their team of maybe two or three PhD or postdoc students to come to work with them. And uh, if they need uh, another base in Shenzhen, we will be able to provide them a base in the uh, joint project that we are working with Shenzhen. So uh, this is uh, one of the schemes, but uh, of course, uh, at the same time, we, we, we love to have other, other talents in other sectors to come to work with us. But one of them, uh, the other thing is to local talents, is to nurture local talents. So uh, our universities will continue to play that role in nurturing uh, local talents to have a far more interest in doing technology. In the last three, four years, some of the money that Alfred has mentioned actually uh, was incurred in nurturing talents, giving them uh, free of charge uh, research positions in the universities and uh, giving subsidies to tech companies to engage uh, PhD and postdoc uh, researchers to work in their companies and, and so on. So we, we will move on, on all tracks in order to uh, attract uh, more talents to Hong Kong. And working with Shenzhen actually gives us some, uh, some better uh, uh, basis because there are things that Shenzhen can offer which we could not, uh, like more spacious housing, uh, more laboratory space. So Alfred's team and Shenzhen's team have uh, co-produced a package, yes. uh, which is a joint package for us to go out to recruit. So in other words, whoever is interested to come to Hong Kong, they will get not only the Hong Kong government policies and benefits, they will also get whatever Shenzhen has to offer. So this is what we call the, uh, the joint policy package to attract uh, overseas talent. So we naturally welcome uh, Japanese uh, researchers uh, to come to uh, work with us. After all, we have a strong community of 7,000 plus Japanese nationals in Hong Kong. We have a Japanese international school. We have 1,400 Japanese restaurants. <laughs> so um, you'll feel very at ease uh, living, working in Hong Kong. Thank you. Perhaps now I could pose a three-part question to um, our speakers from Omron and KDDI. Um, is there anything that you would like to add in terms of the technology um, ecosystem in Hong Kong that you particularly want to highlight to your fellow Japanese companies? Then a very practical question as to how you've gone about finding high quality partners, both in Hong Kong um, and in GBA. Um, and then thirdly, a related question, actually from our friends at the Federation of Hong Kong Industries, do you have any thoughts on how Japanese companies, in particular Omron and KDDI, might work with the Federation's members, whether in Hong Kong or GBA? So maybe Kojima-san, would you like to go first, please? First, about IT, in the case of Hong Kong, as I mentioned in my presentation, 
this uh, uh, support is provided by the government uh, with the uh, subsidies. So we should uh, exploit that uh, on the part of Japanese companies for promotion of uh, DX. So against this background, uh, we are an IT company. And so on the side of Hong Kong, uh, we are identifying a possible partners as we move ahead. So if there are any project, uh, Hong Kong IT company together with them, uh, we can work on the streamlining or promotion of uh, uh, EX, uh, well, uh, DX uh, uh, together with Hong Kong companies. Anyway, Hong Kong is uh, uh, moving ahead with IT and many businesses, partners, are uh, there are quite a few. So that is something uh, uh, over which uh, we can support our customers. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, but would you like to add anything? Yes, this is Fuji. Now within GVA, well, we've been looking for the startups and I said that in presentation and well, there are many Japanese companies, but I utilized the, um, the connection to find them. And in Hong Kong, with the SSC or Smart City Consortium, we've been able to have a connection and we were introduced by accounting related consulting firm in Hong Kong. And I think it's important to build a relationship with the institutions such as Invest Hong Kong or consulting firms that can serve as a window for us uh, to Hong Kong business people. And also second thing is that it's important that we emphasize uh, the women's situation, what Omron can co make contribution. And um, I explained about that and I think it was, it really worked. And thirdly, uh, we have become a member of the, um, the committee, SSC committee, but it's actually me, a local manager is sitting in the SSC committee. So there are some limits to the Japanese, um, Japanese national uh, serving or sitting on the committee. So I think it's important we need to develop local talents as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Takashima-san, is there anything you would like to add from Jetro? You obviously work with a lot of Japanese companies from many different sectors. How do you advise them to go about building their business links um, with potential partners, both in Hong Kong and GDA? Right. Uh, uh, in our case, uh, the Japanese uh, companies who are doing innovation, well, in Hong Kong, and uh, well, uh, we are trying to uh, promote exchanges between Japanese and uh, Hong Kong or Shenzhen companies. Uh, one idea for platform creation, say, Hong Kong Science Park. Well, this kind of function is uh, quite uh, well established. And uh, they introduce companies to us, or they can do uh, matchmaking. That's one of the functions offered by these organizations. So uh, if this is spread GBA wide, then I think uh, uh, it would be better for the more. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. And the question now, again, for the CE, if I may. Um, We've recognized that uh, perhaps the Japanese um, general public have probably not had the full um, facts of the situation on the ground in Hong Kong. And I think we've also picked up that perhaps Japanese companies on the ground here compared to the headquarters in Japan have a rather different perspective. Could you share with us your plans for how we're going to um, get the message across to the wider Japanese um, community about the real situation here in Hong Kong? Uh, thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, that has been a, an issue that has been bothering me for some time. And that is how we could um, give an accurate account to the international audience, especially after the last two years. Um, somehow, the Western and the international media are pretty uh, critical and hostile. Uh, there may be some uh, geopolitical issues and, and so on. But even Japanese media is not very friendly, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, 
So um, uh, my plan is uh, once the COVID-19 situation stabilizes, we need to do far more engagement uh, to reach out and to bring people to see Hong Kong. That's why I said that uh, two years ago, we invited, we actually sponsored and invited a whole delegation of Japanese uh, scientists and professors to come to see Hong Kong for a week. So they could understand all aspects of Hong Kong. So later on, when they read newspapers about Hong Kong losing freedoms and rights, and they, 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 they know that this could not be true. So we need to do far more on that. And I look to our overseas ETOs, and we are fortunate to have a Tokyo ETO uh, with the Invest Hong Kong arm there. So uh, please, uh, together with the uh, Japanese um, agencies and partners and the chambers, uh, who are very friendly wherever I go to visit institutions, um, including, of course, the political party, the uh, Liberal Democrats, they're all very friendly and they have a better understanding of Hong Kong. So we really need to enlarge this uh, correct understanding about Hong Kong um, by reaching out directly to the audience. Like this afternoon, I think uh, the webinar is one of the helpful means for us to uh, reach out and to speak uh, direct, although not face-to-face, -face, but at least uh, direct and for you, uh, for you to ask me uh, questions. Uh, we will do far more of this. And secondly, is uh, we have some money set aside that once travel could resume, Hong Kong will love to organize far more activities, where there is international conferences, um, exhibitions, um, or meetings, uh, art shows, and, and cultural events so that people uh, could uh, come to see Hong Kong. Uh, one of the, the things that we have not lost uh, despite the last two years is on the art and cultural scene. Art Basel mm -hmm. have been coming to Hong Kong uh, this year. Next month, there will be a very unique Art Basel, which is online and offline. And next year, I was promised that Art Basel will bring a much bigger uh, exhibition uh, to Hong Kong. So uh, we love to have more Japanese uh, friends to come to join our events. And I hope, I don't know whether Ambassador Wada, you are there. <laughs> but if Ambassador Wada, you are there, you should continue to organize your autumn festival, your <laughs> Japanese autumn festival. I can promise you I'll be there whenever you need me uh, for your autumn festival events. Now, since um, I do not have the Secretary for Development here to talk about construction, I'd just like to say something about construction. Because uh, in, a, in the past few occasions when I went to uh, Japan, including as a Secretary for Development, I, 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 I invariably try to meet with the minister in charge of construction and infrastructure. Because Japanese construction companies used to play a very important role in Hong Kong. But somehow, after 1997, uh, they, they have uh, retreated a bit. So every time I try to persuade them to come back to Hong Kong, because despite the fiscal stringency and the budget deficits, Hong Kong government is not going to go slow on infrastructure. We will continue to build. I have already announced three new railway projects. We have a lot of housing we need to do. We have a major reclamation and rock cave uh, technology and so on. And on top of that, uh, we have uh, recently a breakthrough in the GBA on construction, which is unmatched uh, in other sectors. In an area called Shenzhen Tianhai, which is again a special economic zone, uh, we have uh, this new arrangement which will allow Hong Kong based contractors in the engineering aspect uh, and consultants in the engineering aspects to enter what they call a record in Tianhai so that they can take business right away without going through what they call the mutual recognition or um, uh, threshold for entry, minimum capital and things like that. So I think a dozen of Hong Kong based companies who are on the government's public works contractors list the CAT C, CAT B, CAT A, have already put in their records in the Tianhai area. So they could now accept business. They could join tenders when there is a tender, whether by mainland company or by Hong Kong company. And by the way, we have 11,000 11, Hong Kong owned companies in this 20 kilometer area called Tianhai. And I can disclose a bit. Uh, Tianhai is going to be enlarged pretty soon because it has developed so well in the last 10 years, 
So uh, I understand, in fact, it was reported in the Xinhua News um, last week that Shanghai will have, will have this bigger area to work from, which means that the preferential policies given to Hong Kong construction company, and hopefully in time to come to the legal profession, the accountancy profession, will likewise have a much bigger market uh, to work from. And this is really good news for our Hong Kong construction companies, as well as our overseas construction companies, whether it is a UK company, a French company, a Spanish company, a Japanese company, uh, to work from Hong Kong, but doing business in the Greater Bay Area. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're fast approaching the end of this afternoon's event. But see, could I just ask a very quick question on the back of the construction side? Um, you've committed that Hong Kong will meet net zero by 2050. Could you just tell the audience when you expect the key policy announcements to be made? Well, we have actually announced a few because uh, it's a building block approach uh, and it has to be continuously reviewed. But a big document on the climate change will come out in the latter half of this year. But meanwhile, we have already announced a um, policy uh, blueprint for the popularization of e-vehicles. Because in Hong Kong's carbon emission, electricity generation accounts for about two thirds, I think. And on that, the policy is very simple, is to reduce and eliminate coal altogether and go for renewable energy and um, maybe in time to come hydrogen uh, generation and so on. But on the transport, which is also an important emitter of carbon, uh, going for electric vehicles is the only solution. So again, this is an area that um, uh, Japanese um, uh, vehicle companies could work with us because many of the brands are sold in Hong Kong are Japanese uh, brand. And we have also announced a, a waste um, policy. How could we when manage our waste better? So it's a waste to energy uh, arrangements through uh, incineration and, and so on. But the, the, the biggest policy on the whole climate change will come out, I hope, hopefully, uh, later part of this year. Well, thank you. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw this afternoon's discussions to a close. Sorry we haven't answered all of your questions. Um, but as I said, we will follow up with you um, after the event. Most of all, could I thank you all for joining us this afternoon? And I really do hope that you have found our wide ranging discussions both informative and stimulating. And on your behalf, I would like to thank all of our speakers this afternoon, the CE and her team, Kojima-san, Yamamuchi-san, and Takashima-san, for sharing their very personal insights into the reality of the business environment here in Hong Kong. Looking to the future, if my colleagues either here in Hong Kong, um, at Invest Hong Kong in Tokyo, or our colleagues in the Economic and Trade Office can help, we stand ready to do so at any time. So once again, thank you all for joining us, and I wish you a very pleasant evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.